feet below your flight path, we make one modification. Where we detect convective activity, we lower that lower boundary to 25,000 feet. And the reason for that is you can see here, if you were up at cruise altitude and we just showed you the weather that was up here around your cruise altitude, it would just show up as, as green on the display. It wouldn't be very attention getting, but even though the cell is pushing up to, you know, over 40,000 feet into the atmosphere. By looking down into the 25,000 feet, you can see here we have yellow and red on the display. And what we do is we provide a maximum reflectivity indication. So for any point on the display, we show the maximum reflectivity. So in this case, red would be shown on the display. This is just showing you a different way. If here's our flight path and we come across convective weather, we lower the floor down to 25,000 feet, showing you the lower, more reflective part of the storm. And it also helps uh, filter out stratus um, layers as well. Now, on some of the aircraft, there's a selection where you can show just you can show all weather or path weather, and that also helps you declutter stratus weather that might be above you or below you. You can also do this manually by selecting an altitude slice four to 5,000 feet below you. Now you're gonna be in auto mode most of the time, and sometimes you'll see a clear path and no analysis for deviation is needed. And other times it'll be obvious that deviation is needed and also to wear. But sometimes you need to do some analysis to determine if you need to deviate and where. And that's one of the benefits of the RDR 4000. It provides an analysis mode to help you make a deviation decision. And that is constant altitude slices or altitude mode or man mode. Okay. And what this does is provide a laser thin slice through the 3D buffer that you select. It's corrected for the Earth's curvature. The initial slice is at the current aircraft altitude, and then you can dial up or down from zero to 60,000 feet in 1,000 foot increments. If you climb or descend, it'll maintain your selected altitude, and nothing is presented for those parts of, of uh, below ground. This is the same area of weather with a slice at 14,000 feet and a slice at 27,000 feet. So here, even though you have large area of weather, you can clearly see a deviation path through the weather. Here we see auto mode on the left and an altitude slice at 22,000 feet on the right. But let's look at some tougher examples in just a second and using the altitude slices for analysis. We're gonna be looking at how much reflectivity is carried aloft Think of a garden fountain and a much larger fountain in the lake at a nearby park. The larger fountain has a larger pump. Our storm cells are like that. We're trying to determine if our pump or updrafts are like the small garden fountain or the much larger one. The stronger updrafts cause stronger downdrafts and turbulence. We'll do this by looking at the reflectivity of different altitude slices. Typically, the more moisture that is carried aloft above the freezing level, the more dangerous the cell is. In addition, in a minute, we'll talk about some additional clues like attenuation, turbulence, hail, and lightning. But vertical profile also gives you a good indication of how much reflectivity is carried aloft. I say vertical profile is like a combined detection and analysis mode. The only difference is it's, it's provided along a single slice, where as the altitude slices are for the entire plan view of the display. So I'm not going to go through this example. Uh, you can Google this. Uh, you can Google analysis using constant altitude slices or enter this link. But it's good to walk through this example. Uh, this one shows some low-lying weather, and we're going to be looking at these cells ahead of the aircraft, but there's some stratiform weather off to the left. And as you get closer and closer, and we're analyzing this in auto mode and looking at altitude slices, you might think that the cell on the left is the one that's more dangerous. But as we start looking at it, the cell on the right is actually the one that's carrying more reflectivity aloft and is more dangerous. And you can start to see that as you get closer and closer. And as you get into the range where you can detect turbulence, you can see that the cell on the right is really the only one that we need to worry about. And there's actually a clear deviation path through there. 
One other mode that we have is REAC or rain echo attenuation compensation technique, and it indicates areas of attenuation or radar shadows. And the nice thing about this, and if you've used a feature like this before, is they generally just show you where the attenuation is and the azimuth of that attenuation. But like in this example, where you don't have as strong of a cell here, it's not only just showing you the azimuth, but it's actually showing you where the magenta begins. That's where you run out of color calibration. So up to that point, your display is still calibrated. The turbulence detection on this radar is exceptionally good, and it's out to 40 or 60 nautical miles, depending on the installation. In auto mode, it's plus minus 4,000 feet around the aircraft. And in altitude mode, it's for the selected slice. It provides fewer false indications, uh, increased detection accuracy. It's up to 12 times more sensitive than conventional radars and better correlation between turbulence and the predicted G-forces. And it's more of uh, magenta blocks makes it easier to see uh, in high brightness uh, situations. One of the other great things about the 3D buffer is we have a database of live storm cell information that we can analyze to predict conditions conducive to the development of other weather hazards. By looking at vertical columns of the weather throughout the 3D buffer, we can find areas of convection. Then applying additional information, such as altitude and intensity of reflectivity, we can predict areas that are likely to produce hail and or lightning. These are then presented on display as icons indicating the range and azimuth is shown. Hail and lightning icons are shown out to 160 nautical miles and, in, and indicate that conditions are conducive to the development of hail and or lightning. This provides additional information to aid you in making a deviation decision. I mentioned vertical profile before and on aircraft that have the vertical profile display, they typically have three uh, different modes. You can see uh, the weather along your track. You can, if you have an area of interest that you want to look at the weather, you can do a selected azimuth to the left or to the right. And the last one is really neat. If you have a dog leg flight plan, it'll show you the weather in the vertical profile view as if it were a straight path. So it's very easy to see the vertical extent of cells and how much reflectivity is carried aloft. So now we'll look at some in-service experience or, or questions and things that we've received from operators. So let's look at a couple things that are often misunderstood about X-band weather radar systems. This isn't really any different from legacy radar, but a, pilots, a lot of pilots think that the radar should detect these. But radars are designed to reflect off of water droplets of sufficient size and quantity. They do not detect water vapor, clouds, fog, volcanic ash, or extremely dry hail and snow. Rain, wet hail, and wet snow are very good reflectors of radar energy, but dry hail, for example, only returns about 3% of the energy that a raindrop does. At times, pilots may see a cloud mass and think that it should be shown on the radar display. Large white puffy clouds may be a developing storm cell, but they will not show on the radar until there is a sufficient size and quantity of water droplets available. Somewhat less obvious, immediately after a storm cell is dissipated and little to no rain is falling, a dark cloud mass may still exist that hasn't broken up yet due to the wind. The pilot can try increasing the gain to see if they're just below the green threshold, but there may not be enough reflectivity available. Another item related to reflectivity that pilots observed when they first started using the new system was magenta turbulence indications in black areas. The reflectivity chart in the picture illustrates that black doesn't mean it's not raining. It's just raining at a rate below the threshold, the FA set for green, which is 20 dBZ. With older radars, to detect turbulence below the green threshold, the radar would need to be about three nautical miles away from the turbulence in order to see it in black reflectivity. Because the RDR 4000 is much more sensitive, it can detect turbulence at the same reflectivity level from about 15 nautical miles away. The turbulence detection capability on this radar is much more sensitive and accurate, so keep it turned on and learn to trust it. The new digital radar systems on the market today provide many benefits in terms of ease of use and enhanced situational awareness, but they're still subject to the same laws of physics as their predecessors. So as we use the system, we need to keep these limitations in mind. A good way to understand the limitations is to break them down by distance or range. At long ranges, the beam is extremely large. 
so everything will be shown as flight path weather since there is an adequate resolution to separate it into flight path and secondary. But again, this should not be an issue because at this distance, the weather should only be considered strategically. As the weather gets closer, it will separate into flight path and secondary weather and provide adequate resolution for analysis. Recall that all radars are subject to line of sight limitations. The red area in this picture shows where the radar's energy is blocked beyond the horizon due to the Earth's curvature. The radar line of sight, or radar horizon, varies with altitude and is approximately 200 nautical miles at 26,000 feet and 250 nautical miles at 41,000 feet. Even though the radar energy is blocked, we can use this to our advantage. At long ranges beyond the radar horizon, the radar is only seeing weather at high altitudes due to the Earth's shadowing. So any visible weather is likely to be a cell reaching very high altitudes. The beam is expanded, so cells appear larger than they really are. The expanded beam cannot see the details of the cell and will likely show only green or yellow, even if there is a red core. All weather appears as on path because the beam width is so large, it cannot resolve altitudes accurately. Here we know the cell is big, but we're just monitoring the situation because they are farther away. Anything that shows up beyond the radar line of sight is significant and should be monitored. But at this distance, deviation decisions aren't being made. The weather at this range should be viewed on a more strategic basis. By the time the aircraft reaches these cells, they may have moved into or out of the flight path, increased or decreased in intensity, or completely dissipated. At long ranges, all the pilot knows is that they are worth monitoring. At intermediate ranges between 120 and 220 nautical miles, there is no shadowing effect. However, the beam is still rather large and the weather appears very close to the horizon, making it difficult to separate low-lying weather from ground clutter. So stratus is generally not seen at all in these areas. The weather shown in the previous slide that is beyond the radar horizon is tracked and used in algorithms to weight returns in favor of being classified as weather. If you turn the radar off at this time, you will lose that history and weather previously classified as weather may be classified as ground and the picture may look different. Tall cells are easily seen and start to show better definition. The beam is still 30 to 60,000 feet tall, so they will mostly show up as yellow and green because it is an average of the energy of the entire beam width, and any red cores are likely to be much smaller than the beam at this range. All weather appears as on path because the beam still cannot resolve altitude sufficiently. Within 120 nautical miles, the beam width is narrow and we begin to see separation between on and off path weather, and it continues to improve as we get closer. Stratus will become visible around this range, depending on its altitude. Stratus weather may extend beyond 120 nautical miles and will show us on path at longer ranges and transition to off path when the geometry of the aircraft, weather, and beam allow good altitude resolution, usually around 80 nautical miles. Cells will begin to show red cores when present due to the increased resolution and embedded cells can be seen separate from stratus layers. Let's look at an example that will help you evaluate cells. This is probably what we get the most questions about now. The system is doing exactly as intended, but many pilots think because they see a cloud that they should see strong reflectivity on path. With a conventional radar, they would tilt down and see yellow and red, but not know where the reflectivity is in altitude. Looking at the cell just to the left of heading at about 10 miles, the display is showing red off-path weather. The display is enunciating bar on a Boeing display, which means the gain is not in the calibrated position. So with the gain turned up and the cell at a close range, there is not even green on-path reflectivity displayed. In other words, the reflectivity in the upper part of this cell is very low. The off-path reflectivity in the lower part of the cell is not particularly high, as can be seen in this picture, where the gain is in the calibrated position, and the cell is displayed as yellow off-path. The out-the-window view shows a small convective cell that seems to be lacking in the sharply defined edges that would indicate vigorous convective growth. So everything indicates a very weak convective cell with insufficient reflectivity to display any on-path weather. Remember, if in doubt, look at altitude slices to get a mental picture. This cell was not pushing very much reflectivity aloft. When you see vigorous 
convective activity, you usually see what we call hard knuckled or color flowered tops is what's shown in this picture. If you see more glaciated tops, which are like these, a wisp, what we call wispy glaciated frozen tops, it generally indicates uh, not very strong convective uh, activity. So in this example, the out the window view shows a mass of cumulus clouds that's not showing any vigorous vertical development. The radar display pictures are showing very little reflectively, mostly off path with the weather at 40 miles, even with the gain increased. As we get closer to the weather, it is displayed as off path. This is consistent with weather that is reflectivity only at very low altitudes. Beyond 40 to 100 nautical miles, it's harder for the radar to resolve low level weather from the Earth because the weather is too close to the ground. Here, the radar is able to distinguish the low lying weather from ground and is showing some yellow reflectivity. As with the previous example, the evidence points to weak convection with very low reflectivity aloft. If you're ever in doubt, look at altitude slices. Thank you, and I hope this will help you to better use the RDR 4000 weather radar system. Okay, thank you, Steve. Uh, we're gonna pause here briefly and we'll give you an opportunity to ask questions uh, either via the chat window or if you want to take yourself on off mute and uh, ask a question. Again, if you have any questions about uh, RDR 4000 operational uh, view, uh, ask a question in the chat window. Okay. Steve, I had a question from a previous webinar. Uh, what are the principles behind the RDR 4000, um, behind the RDR 4000's ability to detect hail and lightning? Is it based on prediction or measurements? Okay, that's a that's a good question. Um, out of the features in the RDR 4000, uh, wind shear is an actual physical measurement, and turbulence, both both turbulence and and wind shear detection are based on Doppler measurements. The hail and lightning icons are actually a prediction. So we have the 3D volumetric buffer, which is really like a a live database of storm cell information. So we look into the buffer and the algorithm looks at a couple of things. It looks at convective activity, vertical development, and it looks at, again, uh, how much reflectivity uh, is carried above the freezing level and the freezing level itself. And then based on those, we make a prediction of conditions that are conducive to the development of hail and lightning. And, and these are very similar it's our own algorithms, but they're very similar to uh, algorithms that the National Weather Service and other uh, meteorological uh, agencies around the world use for uh, predicting these type of things. So again, it's, it is a prediction based on the data in the 3D volumetric buffer, and it's indicating areas that are more likely to contain those. So along with all the other information that you have you have the reflectivity information the turbulence information you have the attenuation detection hail and lightning is just another piece of information to help you make uh, an informed deviation decision okay thanks steve uh, mm -hmm. looks like we've got a question. Uh, we've had a couple of questions on Adaru and Mark is kind of trying to answer those along the way. I've got another question. Uh, what is the uptake on the current software update? And I think that's uh, that will be covered over the next um, topic. So with that, um, Bob, I'm going to go to your topic next. The RDO 4000 hardware and software update. Hello, my name is Bob Miller. I'm an in-service engineer with Honeywell International, and I would like to invite you to a technical and reliability update for the RDR 4000 weather radar system. The enclosed technical data is export classified as 7994, or no license required. The components of the RDR 4000 radar system include the RP1, which is the radar processor located in the electronics bay, of the aircraft. 
the DA1 antenna drive assembly, including the FP30 30 inch flat plate antenna, a control panel, typically a CP1 or CP2, and the transmitter receiver unit, sometimes called the TR1 or RTU. For the purpose of the latter discussion on the improvements for the Q101 voltage regulator reliability issue, there are two solutions, a software solution and a hardware solution. The software solution for the TR1 Q101 reliability it will be loadable on wing through the RP1. Then the, the code is transferred to the TR1. The hardware solution for the TR1 Q101 reliability is installed in the TR1 at a Honeywell service shop. Current RDR4000 technical and reliability issues, the 930-2000 uh, O10 for Boeing or dash O20 TR1 for Airbus. We have hardware and software reliability programs. And also for the older 930-2000-1 and dash 2 TR1s for Boeing and Airbus platforms, we have a hard hardware reliability program in progress. We have a software solution for the Q101 voltage regulator problem of the TR1. We released a service bulletin on February 18th of 2021, and you can see it's a um, vendor service bulletin 930-1034-22. Uh, this is loadable on wing on a Boeing aircraft. And then the uh, software is sent from the RP uh, to the TR1 after the loading of the R software in the RP. So that is now available. We also have a software solution currently released for the Airbus single aisle and long range platforms. Service Bulletin 930 1005 34 was released on October 15th of last year. Again, that's available as an on-wing loadable software like the Boeing side, you load the software uh, into the RP1 radar processor unit, and then the RP1 radar processor unit uploads it to the TR1 transmitter receiver unit. We also have a pending software solution for the Airbus A350 platforms. And currently it's scheduled to be released in February or March of 2022 pending Airbus approvals. Hardware solutions for the TR1, in which we're replacing the um, current Q101 voltage regulator with a more robust, larger component that provides better heat dissipation. We have a hardware solution for the Boeing platforms already available through Vendor Service Bulletin 930-1034-0010, and that was released in September of last year. For that, the TR1, uh, when it is under warranty, will be sent to the service shop, and if we find that the transmitter uh, radio frequency board is defective, we'll replace that board, which includes the new Q101, uh, with a new circuit card. The hardware solution for Airbus platforms is still in process. We're progressing well. Uh, we're on schedule still for a March, late March, or uh, possibly early April release of this of a service bulletin uh, for a similar Q101 hardware solution for the TR1 for the Airbus platforms. That would be single aisle long range and for the A350. We also have a uh, reliability program in place for the older TR1 units, the 930-2000-1 Legacy for both Boeing and Airbus, and for the uh, older 930-2000-2 uh, original TR1 for the Airbus A350 programs. The engineering investigation for the, uh, the older TR1s is still in progress. And we're now expecting a 
root cause to be determined by June of 2022, uh, followed by corrective actions. And of course, we'll need to gain approvals from the OEMs, Boeing and Airbus, before release of the vendor service bulletin. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, my, again, my name is Bob Miller, in service engineer with Honeywell, and I appreciate your time. Have a good day. Thank you. Okay, again, we'll pause here for questions. If you have a question on that topic, please I'll put your question in the chat window or take yourself off mute. I guess Bob will will try and answer the other question. What is the uptake on the uh, current software update? Well, the um, thanks, Dave. Um, the we highly, highly recommend uh, that the um, software to the RP be accomplished as, as soon as you can. Um, this this software is beneficial um, for uh, the um, uh, for the TR ones that are either the dash 010 for Boeing or dash 020 for Airbus, which have the Q101 voltage regulator. Um, if the uh, if the TR1 is not, for instance, on the Boeing, which has been approved, if it's not at mod 31, it does help increase the lifetime of the solder joints of the Q101. Uh, and then we believe that it it should be used also in, uh, along with the mod 31, which actually changes the Q101 to a more robust component. So it's a win-win. So as soon as you can, uh, at your earliest opportunity, upgrade the software to the RP. The RP is updated, and then in turn, that updates the software within the TR1. You do not have to remove the TR1 transmitter receiver unit to upgrade the its internal software that's done through the RP. Thanks, Bob. Um, we had a question. I think you just kind of answered it. Uh, we had a question from an earlier webinar. Uh, when you're loading the software the, uh, from the service bullet and it appears that you loaded on the RP and not the TR, but the TR is the impacted uh, product. Can you uh, discuss that a little bit? Yes, so I'm going to give you two quick scenarios uh, to, to help all of us fully understand how the hardware and software works uh, in the RDR 4000 system. Even even on a normal routine basis, in other words, every morning that you apply the circuit breaker to the aircraft, the the RP, which is the, the master unit of the system where you have the main software and main microprocessor hardware, it does an internal self-test, checks all of its software and hardware functioning, and then it it sends a request to the TR1 to ask it what it what what its latest software level is, its software code. And if it's not at the latest software code, the RP automatically updates that TR as necessary. The reason we do that is you can imagine if line maintenance uh, had a need to replace a TR1, the RP1 needs to verify that the TR1 is at the latest software level. Or when you do a software update, uh, you do that through the RP1. The RP1 loads the software, checks the software. If everything is good, then the uh, RP then uploads the latest software code for the TR functionality to the TR. And it does this through a bi-directional ERIC 429 data bus system between the R RP and the TR. And as a matter of fact, the last step actually using the TR, the, uh, the RP also uploads the latest code to a circuit card assembly in the antenna drive unit called the GDM, the gimbal drive module. So the RP is the master and it ensures that the TR and the antenna drive are at the latest software levels. All right, thanks, Bob. It appears we don't have any further questions, so let's move on to the next topic, which is TRA, TRA 100B MODES transponder. Yeah, 
and I'm here to present the latest technical and reliability updates for the TRA 100B MODUS and ADS E transponder. Export control notice the enclosed technical data is export classified as 7994 or no license required. The TRA 100B MODUS transponder, which includes ADSB functions, is capable of mode A, mode C, and mode S interrogations, and is a critical component of the overall CAS 100 Honeywell TCAS system. Recently, Honeywell has received reports of low reliability for the TRA 100B, and we have an ongoing engineering quality investigation. Even though engineering investigations are still continuing, it has be, been determined that the following subassemblies and circuit cards uh, have a higher than expected failure rate. The AC power supply, the DC power supply, the data processor input output, which is the main processor, and also the radio frequency assembly, which includes the transmitter and receiver functions. All these modules are under engineering investigation. Our timeline of events for the investigation. Corrective actions and validation by Honeywell is expected in April of 2022. And based on those results, corrective actions and notice of change to Boeing and an EDIS to Airbus to gain their approvals for any necessary uh, ven vendor service bulletins will occur. That's May of 2022. Okay, and again, we'll pause here for questions. Uh, Bob, looks like we have a question on the last topic. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll answer, try and answer that one as well. Uh, what happens with an RP without the latest software loaded? Is the TR not updated? The TR would not be updated. OK, we'll pause again for any questions on the TRA 100B. Uh, while we're paused, I did have a question from another webinar. Um, for the TRA 100B, will there be a, so a service bulletin release or will there be several service bulletins released? We'll still be negotiating that uh, with the OEMs um, and also the actual fixes that need to uh, occur, but uh, it could be one or probably more than likely it, it might be a total of two or even three service bulletins, but it's it's still um, it's still to be determined. We're working with the OEMs. OK, and then another. Uh, I guess the question is, can we check the RP software status on FIT? Oh, we're back to the weather radar. Check back the to RP the weather status. radar, yes. OK, yes, yes. Uh, absolutely. You can determine that in the um, um, the um, in the LCD display on the front panel of the RP. You go to the configuration pages and it will show you the the uh, application software part number it for the uh, for the RP. It also shows it for the TR and the uh, and the antenna drive. But the most important thing uh, is if, uh, would it would show the uh, the latest software version for the RP in the configuration pages. And you want to you want the application software number. And, and I guess a follow on question, is it an AMM install requirement? Hmm. I do not have a quick answer to that. <laughs> Good one. OK, all right. the, yeah. No, we'll take an action a... and. Yeah. and respond. I think, Rob, we've got your email address by virtue of you on the webinar, so we'll uh, we'll send you an answer to that. OK, let's move on to the ne next topic. 
which is the uh, flight data recorder cockpit voice recorder. We're going to discuss the technical and reliability updates for the HFR5 series of solid state flight data recorders and solid state cockpit voice recorders. Yeah. Export yeah. control notice. The enclosed technical data is export classified as 7E994. No license required. The HFR5 series of recorders includes the HFR5D, D for data. The HFR5D is a craft survivable recording device and records the mandatory flight data and writes that data to a crash survivable memory known as a CSMU, crash survivable memory unit. Problem statement, airlines have been experiencing multiple unscheduled removals of their Honeywell HFR5D flight data recorders due to complete failures on the aircraft. Initial testing found that the 115 volt AC input circuits were opening. The power supply board known as the system controller and power supply board, which has a has the uh, problem with the power supply section is common to both the HFR5 FDRs and HFR5 series CVRs. Both types of recorders have the potential for this particular failure mechanism. Potential corrective actions for the HFR5D, which are currently under continued engineering investigation. A root cause for the 115 volt input failures are due to cracking and shorting MLCCs. MLCCs are multi-layer ceramic capacitors. We're moving to a new type of flex lead capacitor which will solve this problem. Also, we're installing a more robust version of a rectifier diode. And we're going to also install some more robust inrush resistors which act like fuses on the 115 volt line. The HFR5 series also includes an HFR5 V or cockpit voice recorder. Very similar to the flight data recorder version. It includes a crash survivable memory unit. The recorder obtains audio information from three cockpit microphones and a wide area microphone in the aircraft. And it is also capable of recording CPDLC or data link and recording that on a sub channel as well along with time stamp information. Problem statement for the HFR5V. These recorders were found with defective crash survivable memory units upon annual inspection. It was observed that some of the CVRs had only 10 minutes of recording time instead of two hours. And it was found that internally the crash survivable memory unit was not properly communicating with the main processor on the system controller and power supply circuit card assemblies. Potential corrective actions. A bond or stiffener, as you can see by the diagram, uh, is, is been recommended to be uh, as part of the um, header connector that the CSMU uh, attaching cable connects to the system controller and power supply board to make that little board more rigid so that uh, it does not cause cracking of solder connections. The timeline, we're predicting entry into service of any corrections after approvals of Knox and Edis's for Boeing and Airbus to allow us to submit any necessary Vendor service bulletins will occur no later than November of 2022. 
thank you for your attention and have a good day. OK, we will pause here again for questions and answers. And we again, if you have a question, please put it in the chat window. Or if you wish, you can take yourself off mute and ask the question. And again, uh, Bob, I've had a question from a previous webinar. Um, in the final service bulletin release, will, will this be a mod and a part number role? Or do you know exactly what this will be? Well, historically on the, uh, um, for this level of hardware or the, uh, the level of hardware changes that need to be made on the Boeing versions, it may just be a, a hardware mod or mods. Um, and then possibly for the Airbus version, it would be a an actual part number role. But again, we're uh, it's a little early. We're still negotiating with the OEMs on that. Okay, we have a follow on on the PRA 100B. Will the hardware mods uh, change the part number? Again, sorry to keep giving the same answer, but to be determined. <laughs> Yeah, again, we would like to see just a mod level change, but um, there there might be um, there might be a, a requirement for a, a hard look, a, um, an actual part number role again to still be determined. We're working with the OEMs. All right, thanks, Bob. And now we'll go on to the next topic, which is uh, gyro wear out. Hello, my name is Mark Lyles. I'd like to talk to you today about IRU proactive gyro replacements. The IRU provides attitude, velocity, and autonomous position references for flight controls, displays, and various other systems. The ADRU provides these functions as well as the air data function. For simplicity, this presentation will refer to both the ADRU and IRU devices simply as the IRU. Honeywell IRUs are equipped with the GG1320AN gyro. It has been manufactured since 1996 under various part numbers. Most IRUs contain three gyros, the X, Y, and Z gyro, each sensing rotation around the corresponding axis of the aircraft. Note that the Boeing 777FT8RU is an exception to this three gyro count as it uses six gyros and the Boeing 777-SARU uses four gyros. So what's inside these gyros? Well, they contain an enclosed optical cavity that's filled with a precise mixture of gases used as the laser medium. They also contain mirrors, electrodes, and optical detectors used to sense changes in light beam frequency, which is a direct measure of angular motion. These laser gyros have been proven to be very reliable, stable, and accurate for years of operation, but do have wear out mechanisms that ultimately limit their operational life. So what is gyro wear out? Well, gyro wear out is a condition in which after many years of operating, the gyro output decreases to a point where the IRU system declares itself as failed. It is the primary driver of IRU failures. It occurs after many years of power on operation, not just light time. The IRU declares itself as faulted when laser output reaches a minimum operational threshold. The gyro's end of life phase is referred to as the gyro wear out phase and is characterized as a rapidly decreasing laser intensity, but one that is still above the minimum. Once the wear out phase has started, the gyro is most likely to fail quickly days or maybe a couple months. Note that there is no indication on the aircraft the IRU contains gyros in the wear out phase of life. The IRU will continue to operate until device level byte declares an IRU fault. Note that for certain Airbus ADRUs, there is a new feature that's available called the gyro life monitor. The gyro life monitor is currently being introduced in the HG2030 AE25 and HG2030 AE45 ADAROOS. It provides an indication of flight and maintenance crews when one or more gyros in the ADRU 
have an estimated 300 to 500 operating hours remaining before failing due to end of life. This preemptive indication is intended to prevent interruptions to revenue service and allow airlines to schedule at their convenience a time to repair or replace data room. Remember, gyros eventually wear out. They don't have an unlimited lifespan and will typically wear out after many years of service. Frequently, when an IRU is sent in for repair due to a failed gyro, only the single failed gyro is replaced. The remaining gyros may also be near end of life, and if not also replaced, will result in limited operational hours before the next gyro failure. Let's take a look at an in-service scenario. Initially, all gyros in the IRU have the same power on times. In this case, the first gyro fails at 65,000 hours due to wear out. It's removed from the aircraft, sent to the shop, repaired, and put back in service. 5,000 hours later, the second gyro fails due to wear out. Again, the unit is removed, sent to the repair shop, and put back into service. After just 2,000 more operating hours, the third gyro fails due to wear out. And again, it's removed and sent to the shop. The result is three distinct IRU failures, three distinct IRU removals, and three shop visits. So let's consider a proactive approach. If all three gyros were replaced at the first shop visit, two ADRU replacements and their associated schedule interruptions could have been avoided. Note that Honeywell provides two service information letters with useful information regarding gyro life and proactive gyro replacement. The document numbers are listed here and are available on our technical publication website. Note that after implementing a proactive gyro replacement plan, a major operator realized over 100% improvement in their MTBF. Honeywell offers multiple repair and support solutions to meet the varying needs of the operators and include time and material, tiered flat rate contract, gyro exchange contract, maintenance services agreement, and maintenance services agreement with gyro soft pull option. Contact your Honeywell customer business team to discuss options regarding IRU maintenance in your fleet. So here's some tips to assist in managing gyro wear out. First, Track gyro hours in each IRU. Develop a gyro tracking spreadsheet to record gyro hours in your fleet. Request gyro hours be included in the shop repair reports and update your spreadsheet with that information. Review your spare IRUs. Note the gyro hours in your spare hardware. Ensure that spares have gyro hours well short of the gyro wearout period. This will reduce the likelihood of early removals after installation of the spare. Also, manage IRU power on time. During overnights, turn the IRU to the off mode. So here's a, a brief uh, discussion on a gyro tracking spreadsheet. The inputs are the operational hours of your fleet for the year and the entry of the gyro hours that were reported in the last shop reports. The output of this model is going to be an estimation of the current gyro operating time. And through this, you can highlight any gyros that have operating times over a preset threshold that you've decided on. Okay, well, that's all that I have for you prepared in the presentation. So at this point, we're open to uh, any questions that you may have. All right, thanks, Mark. We'll pause here for questions. And, and we've had a couple of questions throughout the throughout the webinar. I, I think you've answered most of them, Mark. I believe so. So Ar Arun, do you have any follow on questions?
he has a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. um, so I think uh, I think the best thing to do is is to uh, contact Mark offline. Um, I think Arun Mark uh, has uh, Mark has your uh, email address, so he'll send you an email and uh, you guys can have a conversation offline. Um, for other questions, I do have a couple other questions that I've seen in other uh, webinars. Um, do operators have to request gyro time? It, it, you mean it meaning it doesn't automatically come from the repair shops? Uh, and, and again, is the time reported power on time? P please explain. Yeah, so you you will not get any gyro operating time unless you, unless you request it when you send the unit in for repair. If you're already getting those hours on your repair reports, then it's because someone previously has, has requested that and they've just associated that with your account. Uh, and yes, just to be clear, the hours that are reported in the repair report are the gyro power on hours. So anytime the power is applied to the IRU, the, the lasers are lasing and uh, and they're accumulating the power on hours. Okay, thanks. And the other question I had is, uh, uh, you, you mentioned Airbus has the gyro life monitoring. Uh, is is Boeing going to do a gyro life monitor? And if not, yeah, the, who would they talk to? Yeah, the the first uh, gyro life monitor feature that's going to be introduced into Boeing aircraft is going to be introduced. Uh, in the new I Aderu, which is uh, anticipated to be available in a 737 MAX 10. So stay tuned. All right. Thanks, Mark. All right. And then the last uh, quick video we'll show on, uh, on getting information or, or requesting information from the portal. I'm a Honeywell Aerospace Field Service Engineer working in customer and product support. Today, I'm going to show you an enhancement on the Honeywell My Aerospace portal, which gives you access to product reliability updates. Firstly, you must log into the My Aerospace portal with your user ID and password. From the landing page, if you already have shortcuts selected, you can say, select technical support. If not, select services and support. You'll see a number of drop downs and you need to select support. From the next set of drop downs, you select technical support. On the technical support page, you will see that we have many technical support tools available, including training videos and publications. In this instance, we want product reliability updates. We are pleased to announce a new feature on our product reliability update page. You can now subscribe to receive updates whenever a new presentation is posted. From the product reliability update page, select subscribe to updates. Populate the form with your details. Tick the checkbox and submit. You will now receive notification every time new reliability presentation is posted. I hope you found this short video helpful. Thank you. Okay, we will pause here quickly for any further questions that you may have. Last, last minute questions. 
Also, I want to uh, say uh, Jeff Kacharski has put in the uh, uh, a survey for the, the webinar. We request that you uh, put in your feedback. We really value your feedback and it really helps us uh, target these for what you want to hear about. So thank you for, for taking that survey. And we really thank you for uh, your time and, and calling into this webinar. I don't see any further questions, so I want to say thank you very much for attending. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you.